Hi, I'm Cyrus Angerer, a member of the European Parliament and organizer of this conference, Rolling into the Future, Recreational Cannabis Legislation in the European Union, where we will be exploring human rights-based policies for future legislation. Let me start by thanking ANCOD, the European Coalition for Just and Effective Drug Policies, without which this conference would have definitely not have kicked off. As a local politician, I have always ensured to put myself on the very front of all debates relating to civil liberties and freedoms. I believe that human beings should be free to make the decisions which govern and define their lives. I believe that people should have the opportunity to be whoever they are, love who they want and live their lives in the way that they deem fit. So, after having worked firsthand on the introduction of civil liberties in my country, Malta, with the aim of achieving equality, I believe that one of the next steps was to introduce a legislative framework which governs the possession of cannabis for recreational and personal use. This could not remain unregulated and we couldn't continue to treat users as if they were criminals. It was with this in mind that we wrote my party's electoral manifesto in 2017. And I therefore welcomed the Maltese government's white paper and public consultation titled Towards the Strengthening of the Legal Framework on the Responsible Use of Cannabis. This is, among others, what we will be discussing during today's conference. I believe that this is the natural next step for our country. But as we all know, with great freedom comes great responsibility. And while we must ensure that no one must be charged for smoking a joint, we must also ensure that any policy we implement is well thought out, fair, just, rooted in the social community and strays far away from hyper-capitalist development. We must lead our debate on evidence which focuses on harm reduction and best practice, which must include an open and honest discussion, not only with young people, but also older ones who have been using cannabis for decades, about drugs and drug use and a legal framework which leaves no one behind. Prohibition policies have caused multiple human rights abuses across the world. Being imprisoned for personal cannabis consumption with an entirely victimless crime results only in ruining the lives of young people all across the European Union and the world. But as a politician who sits firmly and proudly on the left, I am a big believer in listening to the people who are affected the most by the policies we as decision makers are working on. So before we kick off this conference, I have invited five different people from five different European organizations representing cannabis users to speak to us so that we can really understand what the situation is like on the ground. Let's listen to what Oscar, Derek, Michelle, Ricardo, Andrew, and all the others have to say. What we're seeing is that more and more cannabis and cannabis-related products are becoming more dangerous and more accessible to the younger parts of their society. And that we, by not doing anything, are pushing this younger generation into harm's way, into the hands of drug dealers. And drug dealers depend on these products. 50% of their revenue come from cannabis and cannabis-related products. So this shows that this really raises a red flag. It, there's a lar the alarm is, is, is ringing and we need to do something about it. What we have seen is that many countries and states have actually legalized drug use for personal or recreational use. And they have been able to show that in a regulatory in framework and environment, it is possible to do so providing the protection to the citizens. If we do it right, and this is an opportunity for the European Union, we can actually legalize cannabis and usage in, in the European Union in a way, in a regulatory framework that can be promoted uh, through a public health lens, which means that it can be focused not on raising consumption, but actually deterring consumption, making sure that people consume less through strategies that public health officials can implement. And if people decide to consume anyway, we can make sure that they do so safely, keeping them away from drug dealers and from the dangerous products that are currently out there on the market. And of course, with the tax revenue that would come from legalization, we can invest more on health prevention, which also includes on dealing with the issues of addiction. This is a unique opportunity for us to do what's right. Just like 20 years ago here in Portugal, policymakers took the brave and courageous decision 
of doing what had never done, been done before. We, are, we have a calling to make sure that we protect our citizens, especially the younger generations, for the future. Thank you. The decriminalization law determined quantities that should not be exceeded, but it didn't foresee sanctions for these cases. So in 2008, the Supreme Court of Justice re-established the crime of drug use uh, for users holding larger amounts than permitted, which gave rise to a sharp increase of punitiveness, including uh, sanctions uh, of jail terms. Drug users that come to the commissions are mainly cannabis users. 83% of them are cannabis users. And after the assessment, we found that uh, 90% of the drug users are non-dependent drug users. If drug use is not a crime, and if the vast majority of drug users are non-problematic, there is no reason for non-problematic cannabis users to be framed either in the justice or in the health systems in a mandatory way. Hi, I'm Andrew Bonello, President at Relief Malta. And for the past years, together with a team of dedicated researchers, I have been pushing for a more humane approach to address cannabis consumption and cultivation in Malta. In 2019, Relief Malta launched a proposal for a regulated and legalized cannabis market, revolving around eight main points and based on three cardinal principles. The right to health, privacy and accessibility for people who use cannabis, the importance to ensure social equity and expungement of criminal records, sustainability and protection of local resources. Cannabis still remains illegal, yet amendments in 2015 brought some minor changes. We saw the depenalization for up to 3.5 grams for personal possession. Anyone caught with above this amount and cultivating is still um, found as having committed a criminal offence. National Drug Report states that the majority of drug-related um, criminal court cases are related to cannabis. Even these cases brought in front of the tribunal are mostly related to simple possession of cannabis. In 2021, a white paper which had some interesting proposals was released by the government, such as decriminalization of possession up to 7 grams, the decriminalization uh, to cultivate four plants per household, expungement of criminal records and higher amounts of personal possession. However, it is unclear how the police will adjust to these new provisions and one looks forward to increased information on this matter. Relief Malt has always spoken about the importance of reducing the commercial component from any legislative reform and ensuring cannabis consumers are provided with the tools to consume cannabis in a safe environment. So, yes, I fully agree with the Cannabis Social Club system, especially the guidelines published by ENCODE in 2020 and the focus on the non-commercial aspect of allowing the shared cultivation and consumption of cannabis. I look forward to the introduction of the first legal steps to decriminalize the personal consumption and cultivation of cannabis in Malta and move forwards towards more just and inclusive society. The Netherlands is known worldwide for its cannabis coffee shops and liberal drug policies. But sadly, cannabis is still illegal in the Netherlands and repression against home growers commercial growers and coffee shops has been increasing over the last 20 years. Fortunately, the general elections of March 17 have created new chances for real change and legalization. The future of our Prime Minister Mark Rutte, an opponent of legalization, has become unexpectedly uncertain. D66, the party that is most active on cannabis policy, has won big in the elections. This year saw the biggest campaign in our history to get cannabis consumers to the vote and inform them about the cannabis policy of the different parties. In February, the VOC, the Union for the Abolition of Cannabis Prohibition, published a national cannabis newspaper that kicked off the campaign. 100,000 of these free and ad-free newspapers were distributed via the coffee shops. In March, the Kana Stembus or Kana voting bus drove across the Netherlands for 11 days. 
This microbus was converted into a corona-proof studio with multiple cameras and a continuous live stream. I myself presented this live stream and I interviewed a total of 96 people on the bus. Members of parliament, uh, other politicians, coffee shop owners, growers, connoisseurs, experts and even one mayor. The 66th member of parliament Vera Bergkamp officially opened the Kana Stembus by cutting a green ribbon. The VOC worked together with several NGOs, coffee shop unions and other companies on the campaign. With their help, big boxes with posters, filter tips, national cannabis newspapers and go vote vests were delivered to all 570 coffee shops in the country. The campaign was covered by quite a lot of media, including the national TV news bulletin and the number one satirical news show Zondag met Lubach. Of course, it's hard to determine exactly what effect the campaign has had on the elections. But it's safe to say that the new political playing field has created new chances for legalization here in the Netherlands. The immediate future of the policy on cannabis depends on the answer to two questions. One, which parties will be in the next government? And two, will Mark Rutte retain his position as Prime Minister of the Netherlands? The answer to that second question is up in the air after a series of blunders and a blatant lie by Mr. Rutte around Easter. His departure as Prime Minister has become a real possibility. It's no secret that Mr. Rutte's party, the VVD, is very divided on cannabis. The Liberals want legalization, while the law and order conservatives in the party fear electoral damage if they support it. Despite having lost the confidence of a large part of the new parliament, Mr. Rutte wants to continue as prime minister. And even if he does succeed in clinging to power, D66 will be in a much stronger position during the negotiations to form a new government. So what about the so-called weed experiment? This experiment will probably continue, although the list of 10 companies that will get a license to grow cannabis for the 80 coffee shops in the 10 participating cities still has not been published. The experiment was a political compromise from the start, created after the last elections of 2017, to keep the two Christian parties aboard the government. Just before this year's election, Member of Parliament Vera Bergkamp sent the so-called weed law to the Senate. This weed law got a majority in the House of Representatives already back in 2017, but it was put on the back burner as part of the weed experiment compromise. If the weed law gets a majority in the Senate, the backdoor problem will be solved for all the coffee shops in the country. Another scenario is a new government with or without Mark Rutte as Prime Minister taking fundamental steps to legalize cannabis, including home growing, edibles, and other aspects that are not covered by either the wheat experiment or the wheat law. One thing is for sure, the VOC will keep pushing for real change until cannabis is finally liberated from the claws of the penal system, to quote former Dutch Prime Minister Dries van Acht. Hello, my name is Oscar Perez. I'm the deputy director of the ICERS Foundation, which is an NGO based in Barcelona that works in war and drug policy. So I wanted to talk to you about the current situations of cannabis social clubs in Spain. Somehow we could say that a large scale sociosanitary experiment is underway in Spain because the path that brings us to the actual model of cannabis social clubs began in 1994 in Spain and nowadays we have more than 1,200 cannabis social clubs operating in Spain. The paradox is that it has never been a specific regulation for the activity of cannabis social clubs. So even more than 1,200 cannabis social clubs open their doors every day. The individuals in responsi in responsible for those cannabis social clubs face the risk of being sentenced to several years of prison or steep fines. In recent years, while lower levels of public administration have been adopting a regulatory initiatives in this area, other branches of the government, such as the national government or the Supreme and Constitutional Court, have been adopting 
uh, more prohibitionist uh, perspective. It has been crucial that from 2015 to 2018, both the Constitutional Court and the Supreme Court handed down rulings on the laws of autonomous communities that regulate cannabis social clubs and also the responsibilities against the responsibilities of the individuals belonging to cannabis social club, especially the ones in management positions regarding the cultivation of cannabis uh, for the club members. However, in the past 20 years, the majority of the cases involving cannabis social club members that went to trial were dismissed and the accused were acquitted. We could argue that in Spain there are two opposite, oppositing approaches to dealing with this issue. In one hand, we have what we can call the regulatory path, which includes the regulatory changes proposed by civil, uh, several city councils, such in Catalonia, more than 45 municipalities have issued their municipal permits, but also by popular legislative initiatives, such as in Navarra or in Catalonia, where more than 55,000 signatures of citizens were collected. And also in this regulatory path, we find decisions of several other regional uh, autonomous parliaments in favor of regulating uh, the cannabis uh, activity, cannabis social clubs activity. Also, a few proposals have been submitted to the Spanish Congress or Senate, but never had enough power to be approved. On the other hand, again, against the regulatory, regulatory path, we, could, we find what we could say the prohibitionist path. Uh, in fact, here we could identify uh, the person, pre, um, the person who was previously responsible responsible of the national plan on drugs, and the special anti-drug prosecutor, who in 2013 issued a strategy to criminalize uh, the members and, and the persons responsible of cannabis social club by accusing them not only for a penalty against public health, but also uh, for belonging to a criminal organization. Uh, also in this um, provisionist path, uh, which is completely disconnected from the views of the broad, of broad sectors of society and has been maintained by the actual government who was supposed to be more left-wing, but as with this cannabis topic, we confirm that it's not. Uh, with the central government, the actual and the previous, we also find those rulings of the Supreme Court and the Constitutional Court from 2015 to 2018. Those recent cost law established by the Supreme Court on shared consumption, which is the legal figure that uh, where cannabis clubs were built. So this recent new case law, if it is strictly applied, leaves the door open only to cannabis social club with mar much more limited activities with a very few members with a very few amounts of cannabis and such strict requirements make make collective organizing virtually impossible so the supreme court and the constitutional court rulings indicate that appealing to the legal system is no longer a fruitful option for cannabis social clubs leaving them with the strategy of attempting to introduce changes to national legislation. Legislation on cannabis must be changed to respond to demands of thousands of adults who want to continue using cannabis without having to resort to the legal market. The Spanish cannabis movement is an example of perseverance and commitment to changing state drug policies and it has gone so far as challenging the highest courts in the country and it will not let up in these efforts to shift the state provisionist, provisionist approach to legislation on this issue to one that protects the fundamental rights of users. Nowadays, we have cannabis social club members and responsibles inside prison with sentences of more than five years and if we don't succeed, succeed in changing this drug policy, this situation will only go to a worse scenario. 
Thanks a lot, and we are here to help you. Hello, my name is Michel Degens. I'm the president of the Mambo Social Club. Um, I'm from Belgium. Uh, the Mambo Social Club is one of the last remaining cannabis social clubs in Belgium. Um, a cannabis social club is an association of cannabis consumers that are growing their own cannabis to foresee in their own needs and in their own cannabis consumption. In that way, they don't have to deal with people on the black market. They're sure from the quality of the product um, they have for their consumption and there's no crime involved. It's a closed circuit. Um, our cannabis social club is, is forced to stop uh, growing cannabis and we focus on lobbying. So that's what we try to do. We try to move the Belgian politicians in the way uh, uh, to accept the cannabis social club model and to convince them of the merits of the CSC model. Uh, the cannabis social club model in Belgium was inspired and instigated by the late Joop Omen. Joop was also one of the founders of NCOT. And um, the Cannabis Social Club um, in Belgium, uh, it, has, it has been blooming in the, in the past. There were several social clubs, but after the, the operations of justice um, against the Cannabis Social Clubs, uh, most social clubs were eradicated and now we're uh, one of the last social clubs left. So um, the model was under hefty attack in Belgium. The cornerstone of the workings of the cannabis social clubs in Belgium was a ministerial guideline from 2005 that stipulated that uh, if you were found in the possession of one cannabis plant that there didn't have to be any prosecution um, and that uh, the, the plants that were found could remain in the possession of the people possessing them. So uh, Joop interpreted uh, this guideline broader and said if you can have one plant without being punished it must be possible for let's say 100 people to have 100 plants. So that was uh, the cornerstone of the Belgian cannabis social club model. The clubs um, only grew one plant for each member just like stipulated in the ministerial guideline of 2005. Um, a few years ago, the ministerial guideline of 2005 was revoked, redrawn. Um, it happened in, in all silence and this was also under pressure of a right-wing uh, politician. So in Belgium, um, we have right-wing politicians that want to bring back the war on drugs and intensify the war on drugs even further. So they, um, they made the situation worse. The situation for cannabis consumers in Belgium has never been so bad as it is today. In my 20 plus years I'm involved with cannabis, um, I never experienced a situation like it is today. Um, even though things are progressing in the rest of the world, in Belgium we are traveling back in time and things only get worse. Um, in Belgium, uh, cannabis uh, strictly is, is still strictly forbidden, even though there's there's um, people think there's quite some tolerance, but the tolerance there is is totally depending on the people um, who are or the police people in the field. If they have a good day, not much will happen. If they have a bad day or you live in the wrong area, um, you are into in for a lot of uh, trouble. Harm reduction um, initiatives like um, cannabis social clubs um, are not very well received in Belgium. What experts say in Belgium about drug policy, the, the politicians don't listen to that and they do their own thing and they intensify the war on drugs. So the question that rises is who benefits from the current situation in Belgium? Um, who is um, who is um, winning with the war on drugs and for who is it a good business model? And it seems to be the war on drugs is a good business model for some people and they have a lot of influence. So thank God we have some good scientists in Belgium. Um, one of the advantages we have in Belgium is that we had social clubs in the past. They are studied, scientists um, work together with the cannabis social clubs and there is uh, some data available uh, of the merits uh, of the model. So hopefully we're in um, for a better future here in Belgium as well and the politicians will start to listen as well to the experts because when politicians don't act no change will come and nothing will happen. Thank you very much, have a nice day and thanks for the people of NCOT for having me.
Bye. Thank you for the interesting insights. We can all definitely learn from the experiences that such organizations have shared with us today. But yes, we must listen to other opinions too, away from only those who represent users. Today, during this conference, we are presenting you with two distinct panels. The first, where we have invited world-renowned experts on the topic to discuss the socio-economic European and human rights perspectives of prohibition policies related to cannabis and the harm such policies have caused. On that note, we will then shift onto our second panel, which will look at the different kinds of policies that governments can adopt and what we should all be looking out for. During this conference, we'll be hearing about different models adopted across the world when it comes to cannabis policy. We decided to exclude the capitalist models, such as the ones in Canada, America or the Netherlands. After much consideration over the different kinds of policies, we chose to present you with experts who focus on models which we think are the most just and fair within today's society, that of home growing and yes, cannabis social clubs, or as I like to call them, cultivation social enterprises. But that's enough from me right now. Like you might be right now, I'm very excited to hear what our experts have to say. So let's sit back together and have a listen. I'll be back with you at the end of the panel discussion. So Jonathan, it's in your hands now. Hi everyone, my name is Jonathan Chilia, Deputy Editor with Love of Malta. And today I'll be moderating this really interesting conference organized by MEP Cyrus Enger from the Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats together with ENCOD, the European Coalition for Just and Effective Drug Policies. Thank you so much for tuning into Rolling into the Future, recreational cannabis legislation in the EU, exploring human rights based policies for future legislation. Now, as you've heard in the introduction of this conference by our host, Cyrus Enger, Today we'll be presenting two panels. Um, the first where we will be discussing the socio-economic perspective of cannabis policy and why current policies may be harmful, as well as a second panel on the different kinds of policies that governments can adopt and what we should all be looking out for. Now we've just heard from Cyrus and a number of local grassroots organizations about this situation on the ground. Um, so before we kick off into our first discussion where Dr. Justice Haukop about the socio-economic perspectives of cannabis legislation in Germany. First, let's watch this short presentation from Professor Marco Rossi, um, an economist and lecturer at the Faculty of Political Sciences, Sociology and Communication at La Sapienza on the advantages of legalization of the cannabis market in Italy. I'm going to talk about the illegal cannabis market in Italy and the economic implications of its legalization. The Italian illegal cannabis market is quite large. The trading volume is estimated to be about 5 billion euros. And it's aged. It is operating about 50 years. And there is an increasing share of adult users. About one third of the cannabis consumed in Italy is consumed by adult people, I mean over 30 years old. Traditionally in Italy, there is a very high prevalence rate, about 10% of adults and young adults. So we have about 6 million potential buyers. But what is most important from an economic point of view are daily users, daily users, which are about half a million, and they consume about 90% of cannabis consumed in Italy. The economic costs of prohibition in Italy are direct public expenditures and the social costs consisting of social law, organized crime revenues, and moreover, the users' welfare laws coming from the legal sections, moral stigma, and so on. In the economic literature, it's traditionally to say that taxing is better than forbidding. These are some articles by the Nobel Prize Gary Becker who support this thing is better than forbidding because the unintended consequence of prohibition is the so-called balloon effect that is cannabis demand moves to a tax exempt black market while the intended consequence of regulation by taxation is to control demand 
by setting the, com the contact selling price so that we can substitute the dealer's risk premium with the so-called syntax. Using a Pigouvian syntax gives rise to a double dividend. First, we can have a demand reduction as with equal as in with provision, but moreover, we can get a tax income which can may, may compensate society for the arms caused by cannabis trade. In Italy, if we legalize cannabis, we can have about 100 workers, half a billion of labor income, and a loss on the black market. If we legalize cannabis alone, the same regulation that we use to control the tobacco market, the revenues, the fiscal revenues, can be between 2 and 4 billion of euros. We can save the cost of prohibition implementations. We can give rise to a legalized income of about 1 billion, but we have a loss in the income of the actual illegal dealers. So Professor Rossi put together some very salient points right there. Um, and if you'd like to find more about this topic, you should definitely check out Love Amorta's interview with him. Now, I want to turn to Dr. Haukup. Dr. Haukup is an economist who currently works as a professor of economics at the University of Dusseldorf, where he directs the Dusseldorf Institute of Competition Economics. Um, with his colleagues, he published a study in 2018 where he looked into the economy of the illegal drug markets and the costs of cannabis prohibition in Germany. Dr. Haukup. Yeah, thanks for the very kind invite. I'm more than pleased to be here. Uh, for some of you, it may be quite surprising to hear from an economist because typically if we talk about cannabis uh, legalization or regulation, we talk to lawyers, to health experts, to social psychologists. But for an economist, it's not so surprising because, um, especially as a microeconomist, we deal with the regulation of markets, of particular markets. So um, we always ask ourselves, is there a need to regulate a particular market? And by and large, we can say yes, sometimes uh, a market needs to be regulated. For example, if the market doesn't supply what people want the market to supply. So there may be no provision or under provision. And this is certainly not the problem that we have in the cannabis market. But sometimes there's also a problem that uh, the production or consumption may harm other people. And we also think that there may be a need to regulate the market. Or sometimes there may also be a need to regulate the market if you do harm for yourself and you don't really predict the type of harm because you can't foresee what you do uh, to yourself. So in cannabis, obviously, we have a market. There's supply, there's demand, there's trade. Uh, and uh, basically, the question now is, is this the best regulation that we currently have, namely prohibition? So moving it all to the black market. Uh, and by and large, I think most economists would agree that this is not the best type of uh, regulation, given the increasing prevalence rates, etc., given the uh, impossibility to, con to control qualities in the market and also given the lack of any youth protection that we factually uh, have in the market. So looking at the evidence, um, most probably would agree that prohibition has failed and it's not the best model to regulate the market. So there are currently considerations how to regulate the market in the best sense. But if we think what is the cost of prohibition and not regulating the market in a proper way, for example, with information provision, with uh, particular use protection and so on, there's obviously the cost of not having adequate use protection, of not having adequate consumer protection, given that we have contamination, uh, et cetera. And, and that is some, something that economists may be particularly interesting. And we also have a lack or loss of tax revenues that the government actually forgoes by moving it to the black market. And this is something that we looked at in our study in 2018, given that the lack of consumer protection, the lack of use protection are very hard to quantify. Actually, we said, well, let's try to convince the government what's the loss of tax revenue, actually, that you don't. Uh, um, uh, uh, in, 
don't raise uh, actually because you don't tax it at the moment and don't have it legalized. And then we looked in Germany with very conservative uh, assumptions. We only looked at uh, a consumption of 250 tons, which will be half of what we heard is in uh, Italy uh, at the moment. And only this very small market would also already give raise to tax revenues of about 1.6 billion euros. We worked on the assumption that we could tax cannabis by something like 2.6 euro per gram plus value added tax. We're also looking at income taxes, business taxes, social security payments, and so on. That would all add on to 1.6 billion, working on this comparatively small cannabis market, actually, plus around 1 billion in saved police costs that would not be necessary uh, anymore. If we have a somewhat more realistic approach and say we work on an assumption of around 500 tons of cannabis consumption in Germany, these revenues actually increased to around by and large 4.5 billion euros uh, per year. So this is quite a number that the government actually uh, foregoes. We were very happy to see that one year later in 2019, the French Council of Economic Experts, so a government body that advises the French president or the French government, uh, made a very similar calculation actually. And they were coming up to a figure of 2.8 billion euros for France. Give, while France is a little bit smaller, the cannabis consumption is a little bit higher uh, in France, or the prevalence rates are somewhat uh, higher. So we think this is in the ballpark of our calculation. So that means if we sort of scale this up all over Europe, there are tens of billions of euros that currently EU governments are foregoing by not legalizing um, cannabis that could be spent on whatever sensible matters uh, the government think is uh, sensible. So. Our uh, finding in the end was that there is a strong case for cannabis legalization, for cannabis uh, taxation, but to be quite frank and clear, the foregone tax revenues are not the main argument for legalizing uh, cannabis because this is, in our view, the uh, lack of consumer protection and the lack of youth protection that the current black market does not provide actually in the case of cannabis legalization is particularly strong actually because this is a the supply chain is very very difficult to control given that virtually everybody can grow it at home uh, so prohibition is doomed to fail in that market while in theory it may even work in other market where you have to import the stuff in cannabis there is probably close to no way to really prohibit um, the market. Overall, the same, similar arguments could be made for other drugs, but at least I think we should start with legalizing cannabis. Thank you very much for those key comparisons and points raised about prohibition, especially in relation to the economy. Um, next up, we've got Peter Sarozzi, a human, human rights activist, drug policy expert, founder and editor of the Drug Report website since 2004, author of countless articles, co-author of books and director of films about harm reduction and drug policy reform. Um, Peter, can you tell us more about the EU's drug strategy and the role of its citizens, the interaction between national authorities with the EU and, big and the big business that surrounds cannabis regulation? Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm a member of the Civil Society Forum on Drugs, which is an expert uh, group of the European Commission. Uh, it consists of civil society members. It is a diverse group, so it has prohibitionist and the cannabis reform organizations. Uh, today, I would like to speak uh, about my experiences and uh, some of the barriers we face, like cannabis reform faces in the European Union level. Uh, so one of the big uh, biggest barriers is that the European Union has a, a drug, common drug strategy, but this drug strategy is legally non-binding document. It is there is no accountability for, for member states when um, uh, when we evaluate the implementations. There is no central budget for for the European drug strategy, and uh, when we evaluate this drug strategy, there are there is usually only a process evaluation so we don't really see what is the real impact of what we are doing drug policies on the drug market for example cannabis market and it, 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 it has no uh, real measurable indicators to measure uh, the progress and um, there is an external evaluation but it is not really reflected in the new drug strategies for example all the evaluations say that what works is harm reduction and demand reduction 
What doesn't work is supply reduction, but it is not really reflected in the, in the next EU drug strategies. Uh, what we see uh, on the other hand is uh, what I would call the kind of securitization of the European Union in the previous years. So the security agenda is, is, is increasing while social care and health care is, is disappearing from the agenda. Uh, even the European, in, in, within the European structure, uh, the drug unit is placed within the home, DG home uh, of the European Commission. And it was renamed a few years ago, uh, Drugs and Organized Crime Unit. So it places into the criminal justice uh, framework all this, uh, uh, agenda, all, all this agenda. And when the new, uh, the first draft of the new EU drug strategy was published in July last year, uh, it had, uh, it was part of a security uh, strategy of the European Union and it had a militaristic language. So like anti-drug, we have to fight drugs. So it, it had a drug war on drugs language. So luckily after civil society criticized this document, it was revised and uh, the new uh, drug strategy was published in December, which is much better than the previous one, but it still has a strong emphasis on law enforcement and supply uh, reduction. Another barrier we face as civil society is, is lack of transparency and accountability in the EU structure. So there is a, the, yeah, the Euro EU's council has a horizontal working party on drugs. This is a, an annual meeting of member states in Brussels, but the meetings are not public. Uh, you can't really name and shame what the government tell there. The civil society is not invited only in an ad hoc uh, manner. And when the drug strategies are prepared, civil society can't really see the draft uh, documents. So we cannot really give a meaningful impact in this way. And, and of course, uh, another serious significant barrier is that EU itself is very much divided over uh, drug policy issues. So the region where I'm from, Eastern Europe, all, the, most of the member states oppose uh, cannabis uh, reform. And, um, and the, another problem is the shrinking space for civil society in our countries and, uh, and, and the erosion of rule of law, which makes it very difficult for NGOs to advocate uh, cannabis reform in, in these countries. And uh, Hungary, is, my own country, is increasingly blocking all progressive uh, initiatives in the EU level. For example, in this uh, January, my government voted against the common EU position on the WHO's recommendation on uh, cannabis, uh, the, the use of medical cannabis in the UN. It was an unprecedented that the government or member state breaks the EU consensus. And now there is an infringement uh, process against uh, uh, Hungary. So what uh, the, the European Parliament and civil society can do to improve this uh, situation? I think the European Parliament should demand an honest evaluation of drug policies in the EU. So we need to have a look what works and what doesn't work. Uh, and and uh, we, we, it, it should also demand that uh, the evaluation should be taken in, into consideration. So we, we need to place drug policies from a security law enforcement agenda into a more public health and social agenda and respect uh, the human rights. Uh, and, and also the, the drug coordination in, in, inside within the European uh, uh, system should be replaced from the security to the uh, health uh, part. And um, I, what I see is that there is no chance to reach a real consensus on cannabis reform among member states. But what we can have is probably is a more flexible framework, drug policy framework that allows member states to experiment with uh, new cannabis uh, policies which uh, in the local level, which uh, Tom will speak about more. And, uh, and, and uh, what I also would like to st uh, stress that drug policy reform is not possible without strengthening democracy and civil society in general in the European Union. So civil society should have a strong voice in uh, cannabis reform, uh, which we don't see happening now. Uh, we see that there are uh, big corporations now having some talks to individual governments behind the scene, but we don't really see open discussions with civil society about how to regulate the cannabis market, because I think this is the real question now. It is not when or uh, whether it will be legal, uh, legal regulation, but how we will regulate uh, the market. And I think civil society must be given a strong voice uh, in, in this uh, in this in this debate. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Peter, for that intervention, especially breaking down some of the barriers, you know, policymakers as well as civil society at large may currently be facing. Um, on a similar note, our next speaker is Tom Blickmans, a senior project officer at the Transnational Institute based in Amsterdam. Since 1997, he's been working for the Institute's Drugs and Democracy program, specializing in international drug control policy and the UN conventions, drug markets, alternative development, money laundering, and organized crime. Thank you very much for the invitation. <clears throat> uh, the Transnational Institute uh, two years ago uh, published a report on uh, uh, local cannabis uh, policies, basically cannabis in the city uh, and bottom-up reform uh, initiatives in uh, different cities in Europe. Uh, you can see that, well, at, at, the, at the national level, you can see very opposing, I would say, even policies in, in Europe, Sweden with a zero tolerance, Eastern Europe with, with a uh, reluctance to reform. But on the other hand, you have Malta, uh, which is uh, really uh, progressing to a very uh, broad decriminalization. And, and you call, of course, you have the Netherlands with its coffee shops and Luxembourg that has announced to uh, start uh, that they want to legalize. Uh, but if you would look at the, at the, at the city level, there, there, there is uh, more convergence. And there are, um, in the last couple of years, more and more cities who recognize that the current policies don't work, um, both from a public health perspective as from a criminal uh, law perspective and, and, and criminal uh, cannabis markets in their cities. And they are looking for a way out. And they are advocating for uh, regulating, if not at the national level, then at least at the local level. You can see that in, in Denmark, uh, Copenhagen uh, has, has had four proposals already to, to do so. Uh, in Germany, there are several cities, most notably Berlin even, and uh, cities like Dusseldorf, Hamburg, Frankfurt, who are looking at it in Switzerland. There are, are the bigger cities uh, want to regal, uh, regulate uh, cannabis, Geneva, uh, Basel, Zurich, Bern, and even in Spain, there, uh, there are big cities who uh, want to regulate, like Barcelona, San Sebastian, and, 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 a, and a lot of smaller cities. And even there, you can see that at a regional level, the, the auto autonomous, but Constanza will probably uh, explain that more in detail. There, there are initiatives for, for, for uh, regulating, legally regulating the chemist market. So you can see a, a really a movement at the level of local authorities that uh, uh, they want to go towards such a uh, legally regulated market. And then we came up with a new concept, or new, not a real new concept, but in, in, in regarding to, to cannabis policy, and that is uh, local customization. And we took that from the Dutch situation, where, as you know, uh, we have like 40 years of experience with at least a, a kind of quasi-legal regulation of the sale and the uh, uh, buying and selling of uh, small amounts of cannabis for personal use. Uh, but there was always a problem because that was allowed, but not the supply of cannabis for that purpose, and that was still in uh, a criminal market. But in those 40 years, you can see a development in, in the Netherlands towards local customization. So what, what fits in one city does not ne necessarily fit in another city. Uh, and so you can see, for instance, in the Netherlands, everybody thinks every municipality has a coffee shop. Well, that's not the case. Only 25% of, of the municipalities in the Netherlands have a coffee shops. Other cities and towns uh, opted out for, for, for this to, to do so. So we have seen a lot of proposals from, from all these cities and you can see now that uh, in the Netherlands at least there will be uh, next year, hope, hopefully, or maybe even this year, we'll start a experiment in 10 uh, uh, cities in, 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 in the Netherlands to also have a legal supply of cannabis for the coffee shops. Uh, there's recently, uh, there was also a law change in, in Switzerland will will also allow uh, pilot projects and, and probably within the next couple of years there will be a, a couple of cities who will do that so you can see that at, the, at that level at the local level there is yeah there's a willingness to do so and there is a need to do so because in these mostly the bigger cities 
uh, that ha have the problems. Although you can also see now in France, even there is also a couple of cities like Reims, uh, uh, Grenoble, who also want to go that way. So at the European level, you have a movement basically of cities saying, well, current policies do not work. We want something else. Let us experiment and let us have pilot projects in doing so. And then we'll see what works best and what would, uh, well, how, how, how we can implement that at, at a broader level. And I think you can, if you look at, for instance, the, the US, where in the states where cannabis has been legalized, you also have the option for municipalities to stay out. So I think that is a, a model that might overcome a lot of resistance with people who do not want to uh, regulate. So okay, if, if your town doesn't want to regulate, fine, don't do it, but let don't limit us in, in, in doing what we want. So I think that that is really a, a, a promising way forward. And I would urge the European Parliament to also uh, yeah, try to see if that could be possible in Europe through rules and regulations. Uh, there's very little attention from the European institutions in those uh, developments at the local level, for instance, at the EMCDDA, or, or uh, there is there is no no uh, overview of, of these kinds of initiatives. Uh, so it would be very useful if if the European Parliament would uh, yeah uh, open the door to these kinds of initiatives and also into the research to in these these kinds of initiatives to yeah to make at least a step forward at the moment while there is still a lot of uh, disagreement at the national level. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you so much, Tom, for raising some key points about the approach we are seeing both in different countries as well as different cities. Um, next up, we'll be turning to Dr. Constanza Sanchez. Now, Dr. Sanchez is the Law, Policy and Human Rights Director at the International Center for Ethnobotanical Education, Research and Service. She is a political scientist with a PhD in international relations and is a drug policy researcher and advocate with an emphasis on human rights and social justice. Um, Dr. Sanchez, I know you have a lot of insights, especially on cannabis policies and practices in Spain. Uh, what is your view on an EU coordinated approach to cannabis issues. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I would like to um, well to um, bring the perspective uh, from 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 South Europe. Let's say that the, I'm I'm the region where I'm from. I'm from South South Spain, and I would like to, in order to answer your your question. Um, I would like to, to highlight and, and develop three ideas as a way of using the Spanish experience and, and this perspective from South Europe uh, to fit the discussions towards a potential uh, EU coordinated cannabis policy. The first idea is that um, we can affirm that cannabis occupies a prominent place, let's say, in the social practices of the Spanish population, but this is not reflected in politics. The second idea is that the position that uh, Spain occupies in the international cannabis markets could le let us to think that uh, Spain is in a great hurry, let's say, to find alternative solutions to manage cannabis markets, such as regulation, but this seems not to be the case. And in this sense, we, we may wonder if the European Union could play a, a, a role. And the third idea is that the Spanish government, or rather the, the Spanish society as a, as a whole, in a broader sense, will have to to decide uh, whether to manage the cannabis phenomenon from the field of social and health uh, policy. I mean, uh, a regulation based in or inspired in the principles of social justice and human rights or, or resigned to, to a mere uh, punitive uh, policy to, to manage an, an illegal market. Um, um, in relation to the first idea, uh, uh, what we can see, and this is maybe also, um, uh, applied to, to, to Europe or the European Union in general is that cannabis uh, has a, a, an important place in, 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 many, in, in, in many spaces of, of, of the social European, uh, of the European populations. Um, but um, we don't see uh, this importance in the political arena. I mean, for example, in, in Spain, we have one of the highest uh, prevalent um, um, cannabis um, um, rates. Um, 
uh, sorry, uh, we have one of the of the of the highest uh, prevalence in the European Union, and uh, more than ten percent, and and around three percent of of the Spanish uh, population use cannabis every day. Um, also, we, for example, uh, we have uh, um, a more or less uh, important um, uh, support to, to cannabis regulation, especially in the case of, of, uh, of regulation of medical uh, use, which 84% uh, of Spanish population supporting, or the 47% uh, of the population uh, supporting both recreational and, and medical regulation. So even if we can see this normalization in the in the in the society, Spain lacks a medical cannabis program or recreational uh, market regulation. Um, but I mean is that cannabis as a political issue doesn't hold a prominent uh, political space. I would even say it's not even considered as a legitimate uh, political issue in several uh, levels of government, especially the central government, despite the multiple attempts to, to innovate from, from civil society. What, uh, or this, is part, this could be partly due to, in my opinion, to, to important denials from, from the politicians. Uh, uh, for example, there has been a, a, a a denial of the scientific evidence of or, or concluding the therapeutic potential of, of cannabis, even after the rescheduling of, of cannabis uh, in the Europe in the United Nations. Also, the denial um, or the second like important denial, it's been the, the the potential benefits to deny the potential benefits of drug policy reform, whether there's reform is uh, takes um, uh, the the form of a, a regulatory framework for cannabis users association or a more comprehensive regulation of, of cannabis markets. And um, um, from my point of view, this is connected to, to with two facts uh, in, in the Spanish political landscape. The fact uh, first is the fact that Spain is a decentralized state. And when it comes to, to, to drugs and drug policy, the central government retains power on criminal policy and, schedule, <clears throat> and scheduling of, of substances while the competences on, on health and social policies correspond to the, to the regional entities, the autonomous communities. Also, um, the, the position or the traditional position of, of the two big traditional uh, political parties that um, have um, always uh, support uh, or have always um, um, agreed on not to open the Pandora box on, on, on cannabis regulation. But from 2015, um, uh, we, we, we had um, well, new parties, uh, political parties emerge with great support from, from, from the society. And these parties have uh, a more sense of the need of, of cannabis regulation in their, in their agendas. And so we can say we, we didn't have a, like policy shifts from central government in a strict sense, but we have a, we have had multiple uh, innovative innovative practices um, in the in the last uh, decades in Spain. That's why I, I think it's important to differentiate policy from uh, practices, and and of course the model of, of cannabis users associations uh, was deserved to be to be um, highlighted, and and. This is um, uh, important because it's been an, an alternative conceived by civil society to respond to current drug policies and, and, and policies that prosecute uh, cannabis users and growers. And in the case of Spain, um, it's, it's, um, it's also uh, perhaps an, an exception in, in the European Union in the sense that uh, drug use uh, has never, drug use and possession for, for personal use has never been criminalized. Um, and the only thing, well, what is banned is uh, the use and possession in public spaces, and this is uh, punished with with uh, an administrative sanctions. This is why I call this model. We call this model the cream light because we we drug use and um, is not criminalized, but we have very high uh, very high fines and very high punishment from an administrative uh, uh, core of 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 law. So um, what uh, we have uh, seen. Um, from 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 the perspective of of, of, of policy, uh, we well cannabis uh, users associations they have been uh, civil society innovations. So this means uh, it's not like a 
is the, the policy uh, is not the, the, the existence of cannabis uh, clubs per se, but it's uh, the, the response from, from the authorities. And the, this response has been different from, uh, if we look at the different levels of government, we look at the central government, we, we have, we traditionally had a, 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 an opposition and, and, and somehow the, the attorney general and the, and the, and the um, national plan on drugs has been belligerent again, against cannabis social, social clubs. However, the regional parliaments and, and the municipal authorities has um, passed law, uh, laws to, to, to regulate this, these activities. For example, in the case of, of Catalonia, the Basque Country and, and, and Navarra. And, and, and the thing is that these uh, this attempts to regulate at the regional level, and also we, we, we assisted this year in, in the level of, or in the local level for the case of, of Barcelona, is that the response from, from the central authority has been to denounce these attempts to regulation. So we have uh, had um, um, uh, decisions from the Constitutional Court and the Supreme Court and, and they, 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 this course has closed the path for regional and, and local uh, policy attempts to regulate this, this somehow social innovation. And as uh, concluding remarks and answering to your, to your question, um, I agree with, with many of the, of the, of the conclusions from, from, from the colleagues that have spoken before me. Um, I, I think that the, the European uh, Union, uh, if if they want to to, to build a, a coordinated uh, policy or approach to to cannabis, uh, they need to listen to civil society demands and and especially the experiences from from the ground. I think we also need, uh, as I mentioned, tolerance to local experimentation. I think it, it's uh, the, probably the most difficult thing for, from my EU perspective is to, to find an equilibrium between the coordination of, of, of certain uh, um, dynamics and also uh, uh, allowing diversity, diversity from, for, for experimentation and, 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 and for adaptation to the particularities of, of each country, of, of each context. Um, um, Thank you so much, Dr. Sanchez, for giving us that important overview of the situation, especially from such a key country uh, during this discussion. Now for our final speaker for today, um, for today's first panel, is MEP Alvina Alametsa, a Green MEP from Finland. Um, so I wanted to know what your reactions are to what our speakers have said today, um, and what do you think European policy policymakers can do to get the ball rolling in their member states to start discussions on recreational cannabis laws? Thank you all so much for inviting me today. It's such a pleasure to discuss with all of you, great experts and uh, people who had a lot of knowledge and vision on the topic. So I'm really, really excited and uh, grateful for all of your interventions. And uh, I want to really uh, thank the other speakers for such an uh, inspiring approach to the topic. For, for me, I look at this topic from the point of view of a policymaker. And I think that's a really important perspective uh, of, of this when we are discussing uh, the issues and uh, the use of cannabis. I think that first we need to listen to researchers and experts. And that is something that I would like to, for us to do more. And this is the people that we have here in this room with us today. So I'm really excited about that. One of the biggest issues that we face when talking about humane and effective drug policy is the lack of information stigma and misinformation that also goes around about this topic. But we need to have the conversations because currently there is a huge disparity between the everyday realities of European people and the legislation. 27% of Europeans have tried cannabis and use numbers are on the rise around Europe and more than 25 million Europeans use cannabis yearly. And because of this increase of usage, there is also more encounters with the law enforcement and around 70% of all the drugs seized by the police are cannabis related. And the most common recorded drug offense in the EU is the possession or use of cannabis. And this can have a major effect, for example, on a young person's life. And it can really change their life in, in a bad way for, for having to, to be, uh, be with the police in such matter. 
currently we are using a lot of resources for enforcing the prohibition, but the growing body of evidence shows that that is ineffective or even counterproductive. Of course, we all know that cannabis use is not harmless and we should not try to deny this. But we should remember that the social cost of keeping cannabis illegal is higher both for society but also for the individual user, especially young people. The social stigma, legal consequences, loss of employment, denial of health services are all consequences of cannabis policy, not cannabis itself. This is why legalizing, regulating and taxing would give us better means to reduce harms by, among other things, limiting supply, especially to young people, controlling the levels of THC and other cannabinoids, thereby reducing the harm to users. And I think we should use the money gained from taxes and redirecting police resources to fund healthcare and social services and further helping free people rather than prohibiting it. So how can us uh, as policymakers and people in general do to move this important conversation forward? I think we should more actively talk about drug policy. It is true that there is still a stigma attached to politicians who speak about cannabis and drug policy in general, but by keeping silent, we sustain these prejudices. Us policymakers should encourage good legislation, but also research. And I think that good legislation often comes from research. Here, the EU level is very, very important. And as a member of parliament, I think uh, the drug policies should stay in the competence of the member states, but EU can play an important role by supporting and facilitating the research and gathering and sharing the information and good practices from member states. I believe we also should uh, support grassroots movements, both on the European and national level. Right now, for example, in my home country, Finland, um, the Finnish parliament is considering a citizens initiative on decriminalization of cannabis. So it's a legal initiative. And uh, it gained more than 50,000 signatures. So it is something that the people are, are interested in. And this shows that, uh, that this is something that we need to have more conversations on. And I hope that the parliament would be able to, to consider this. But in the, in the current parliament, um, uh, the chances are slim that this will go through here in Finland. But such campaigns force politicians to discuss it and talk about it. And this is why it's really significant to have these campaigns and push for legal changes, even in the atmosphere where it's not currently possible to have that legislation, because then we will pave the way for the future and the possibilities for the next coming years to have these changes and move the conversation forward. Finally, I think that we need to discuss the topic with a lot of empathy, not only facts. For too long, the drug policies have depended on punishment and the othering of drug users, like it's someone out there, not us, not, not some of our close people. And I think this is not right. We need to remember that the cannabis users are many millions of people in Europe, most of whom live completely ordinary lives. And stigmatizing these people and denying them many things in life and denying also treatment is to me just morally wrong. And for those who have problems with substance abuse, we should treat, treat them with dignity, compassion and effective support systems, just like anybody who faces struggles in their lives. For example, the lack of mental health care can lead to drug and substance abuse issues. And then on the other hand, you might be prevented from getting psychotherapy or mental health services if you have drug use. So here is a really, really problematic circle, especially considering young people. And we should avoid this, but we have the means to do it. It just requires political will. Thank you all so much for listening, and I really look forward to con uh, continuing the conversation with all of the speakers, but also later on after this event. I think it's a really important initiative, and I very much thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Alvina, for raising those pertinent points. Um, that brings us to the end of our first panel for today. Um, during the second and final discussion panel, we will be taking a look at what governments and policy advisors, maybe even policy advisors watching us right now, need to consider to ensure a good cannabis policy model. We'll now be stopping for a short break. Stay tuned for when we return shortly.
Hello, everybody, and we are back. Thank you for tuning in once again. If you're just joining us now for Rolling Into the Future, our recreational cannabis legislation in the EU, exploring human rights based policies for future legislation, a conference obviously hosted by Maltese MEP Cyrus Enger. Now, we are on to our second panel right now where we will be discussing cultivation, consumption, as well as sharing in the European Union as part of a new model of cannabis policy. Now, obviously, as we've heard from previous speakers, as well as in the earlier panel, you know, many people from different walks of life agree that prohibition around recreational cannabis is unjust and unfair. But what is the way forward now? Um, to discuss this with us next, we've got MEP Mikolas Peksa from the Pirate Party in the Czech Republic, who currently sits with the Greens in the European uh, Parliament. Now, MEP Pex, um, I just want to speak to you a little bit. So tell me what details um, need to be included in a, in a cannabis policy in order for them to be holistic and all encompassing. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for inviting me because uh, this is really a wonderful opportunity and I'm really happy that we have this, this opportunity to speak about recreational uh, use of cannabis and uh, other substances uh, in the European Union. I mean, like, this is a quite a complicated topic because so far we are living in a complicated jungle of various uh, regulations that are uh, hindering our, our lives in many different ways. So when, when talking about the European policies on that issue, I believe uh, the most important is actually that the European Union will not uh, restrict its member states and its citizens uh, in applying the policies uh, they want to apply. I, may, I believe like there is no really like silver bullet in terms of regulation, what shall be applied on, uh, let's say a national scale. So the member states shall be allowed to uh, try and uh, apply those policies they consider to be best for uh, their uh, own citizens without uh, uh, necessary restrictions of, uh, uh, from, from, let's say the top level. I mean, this is this is important to to provide sort of like a legal framework that will not restrict our movement across the countries because of various uh, local regulations that are uh, that are hindering uh, and complicating uh, our movement. So, I, just just to summarize, it, I believe we need to provide a framework which allows us to do stuff. What exactly has to be done? It's up to people. Thank you so much, um, MEP Pexa. Um, very, very interesting. Um, and you make some very, very clear points. And I think this actually, you know, sets the tone for our next speaker, um, Dr. Maria Ventura. Now, Dr. Maria Ventura is a pharmacist PhD working as a director of the Drug Checking Service of Energy Control, ABD, since 2007. Um, she is a collaborator of IMIM, which is directly involved with the scientific diffusion of novel psychoactive substances. She's also the TEDI network manager since its beginning in 2011, which is the Trans-European Drug Information Project, a network of European fieldwork, drug checking service that share their expertise and data within a European monitoring and information system. Um, so we're going to speak to her a little bit about how to address people who use cannabis from a harm reduction perspective, um, as well as the type of messages used and what, it, what to take into account, depending on the age of the people addressed. Um, so Dr. Ventura, um, I, I, you'll be presenting some analysis services as far as harm reduction practices, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and talk to, talk to us a little bit about a new trend at the European level, which is referring to the adulteration of synthetic cannabinoids in cannabis samples with uh, low THC content. Thanks, Jonathan, for the introduction. Yes, I would like to share a presentation with you, talking about the experience that we have learned with more than 20 years, thanks to working with people who are using drugs with cannabis. Yeah. So first of all, I would like to explain from where I am. And I'm from an organization, a Spanish organization, it's called ABD. And at the late 90s, we developed a project, uh, it's called Energy Control, because we detect that the use of ecstasy at recreational settings where was bringing more problems that maybe if these persons would have some information they would not have. And then at this moment, we have four different headquarters of energy control in Catalonia, Balearic Islands, Madrid and Andalusia. 
And our main objective is to reduce the risks and harms related to recreational drug use. For this, and now at this moment is more difficult because we don't have nightlife settings, but we were directly going to the nightlife settings to offer the information and using this outreach work and training our peers and doing some short advices and counseling, but go directly to the place where the drugs are used and then also offering drug checking services and other type of services that you can offer directly to the person or also to the group and also that you can, can do this type of harm reduction strategies to the settings and try to, to create safer settings, but at the same time, you can also monitor markets and try to give some advice related of the reality of the illegal market that is related to these substances. We are also um, trying to give some information to people who were falling, I, I would say, of this universal prevention strategy, which is the, the strategy that is telling to people that just say no to drugs. The problem is that there are a lot of people that are saying yes to drugs. And then this message has a lot of credibility of the official discourse about drugs. Then the information they have about drugs is not objective and is not useful to use these drugs. Then with this wrong message, we have a, a, a high risk of misinformation because also we need to take under consideration that these people don't feel good at the time that they were falling off these strategies and sometimes they are using drugs without taking care of themselves because they think that okay taking drugs is is, is difficult and is bad so it's not important the way how i do it we strongly believe that it's very important the way the way you are using drugs and in terms of cannabis it's also important because we need to think that at this moment the illegal market is very touched with cannabis this is also based on the pressure that we have in Spain in the Gibraltar Strait. So the amount of, of hashish and, and the, the cultivation of marijuana in Spain at this, at this moment is much more controlled. And this is provoking some changes in the market that I would like to explain at the end of my presentation. First of all, I would like to, to show a little bit the way we are working with people who are using cannabis. This is the type of work that we offer to the youngest ones. This is, uh, these are flyers and also an exhibition, the one of, of, the, of the right, that we are offering directly to young people. We are using these colors, we are using this type of, of, of strategy to call for them attend, for their attention and to try to give positive message to try to gain their trust and try to work later with them about the, also the risk that they are using or that they are dealing when they are using these substances. So we are trying to reach them from the pleasure, from the benefit, understanding that they are taking drugs in the beginning because they feel pleasure and they like it. And then later we can talk also about the other things that are also important as a risk. This is another, another leaflet that was developed in my country, this in Catalonia, and this was by the public administration. And this type of leaflet is related, or, or at least the target group is more general population. So it is the, the gender is not, is not very specific and the message are maybe are less uh, focused on this target group that are teenagers, but the message are more or less the same. Depending on the target group, we can be more specific on different things, but finally the message are always the same, no? such as the importance of not mixing with other substances such as alcohol, the way or the uh, you are admin, administrating cannabis, it's not the same to smoke it or, in, or use a inhalation or, or the vaporization or use the oral way. Also it's important when to use, not when you are working and this type of strategies. Also, it's very important about to talk legality. In most of European countries, uh, cannabis is not legal. So for, for this reason, you have some exemptions, but you need to take care and you need to be aware about the legality. Also, we are talking about the importance of the marketing on the, on the cannabis and how women sometimes are the objectivation of this, of this, of this cannabis market. For example, when we are talking with young girls, uh, we are quite clear about how uh, gender is influenced by this big marketing of cannabis and how women sometimes 
are taking as an object of this marketing. Also, it's important to talk directly and clear about what it means to have plants in your house in terms of legality. Also about the side effects, what happens when this cannabis is, is decreasing your, your pressure, what happens when you are using more dose than expected because if you were eating instead of smoking. And of course, we are also talking about other interesting things such as therapeutic cannabis, and the use, for example, of filters to use cannabis to reduce the amount of carcinogens uh, related to the combustion, but also depending on the population, but when they are uh, adults, we can talk about drug checking services because the composition of cannabis is extremely important to know which would be the effects of, the, of this cannabis because depending on if they have only THC or if they have also CBD, but also it's important to monitor cannabis because we just discovered something that is, is relevant and that we didn't expect with cannabis because with drug checking services, what we are trying to do is to inform about the composition of, of the drugs that people are using and the, the drugs that they have on us, we can also talk about the hand product reductions practices that they are already applying and which other type of strategies they could add to their, to their practices. But the second objective that we have with the drug checking services is to monitor illegal markets, detecting new trends, drugs, adulterants, practices, and also making this information available to all stakeholders involved because we are, we are aware that we are only reaching a part of the target group, but it's important to expand and extend all the information that we are detecting to all the stakeholders that can be relevant. In this sense, uh, I'm the manager of the Teddy Network, which is a network that uh, have all the drug checking services that are in Europe. At this moment, we have 18 uh, drug checking services in 12 different countries in Europe working, and we are working together we are using different different test methods, but we, we are validate ourselves to compare our results. Thanks for your attention. <clears throat> well, um, thank you so much, um, Dr. Ventura. I mean, thank you very much for highlighting the challenges, you know, we're facing in Europe when it comes to synthetic, as well as sharing the visuals that you've you know, found to be useful in your country when it comes to harm reduction. Um, moving on to our next speaker, um, we're, we'll be turning now to Dr. Mafalda Pardal, who is a postdoctoral research fellow and assistant professor at the Institute for Social Drug Research at Ghent University in Belgium, where she is currently studying whether and how the introduction of a legal cannabis market in Uruguay has affected the illicit market in that region. Um, in recent years, Dr. Pardal's research has been centered on the study of the phenomenon of cannabis social clubs, a topic that's you know quite important around Europe, especially in Malta right now, part of a major discussion, um, as well as in other European countries, as well as in Uruguay. She has published extensively on the topic and is currently editing a book on cannabis social clubs, which will be released later this year. Um, Dr. Pardal, um, can you give us a bit of an overview of what cannabis social clubs really are, what your key findings are from your studies across such clubs in Europe and in Uruguay, as well as some general concluding thoughts on what policymakers should look out for when considering the development of cannabis policies, which include, which include cannabis social clubs? I will. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm just going to share my presentation. Um, is that working? Yep. Okay, perfect. Well, so thank you. And, and thank you for the invitation to join this panel and to bring the topic of cannabis social clubs to the table as well. Um, let me start indeed by, by just mentioning some of the key features of uh, cannabis social clubs. So these are initiatives of adult cannabis users who come together and form an association. And these tend to be nonprofit associations where any revenues are reinvested in the functioning of these associations. And they're members only clubs, meaning that only users that have completed registration with these clubs can enter the premises of the clubs, can participate in the activities that are organized by the CSCs and can access the cannabis that is being produced by these cannabis social clubs. In terms of the supply of cannabis, um, cannabis production typically takes uh, place in a small scale 
And usually the growers that cultivate these plants within the cannabis social clubs are also members of the association. So it takes place in house and on the basis of cooperative principles. So the idea is that the different, the different members contribute to the working of the association also in, with regards to cultivation. And uh, finally, another aspect um, that has to do with the working of CSCs relates to their engagement in the broader cannabis movement and in activism. They are vocal advocates for a change in current cannabis policies. And in particular, they argue for the introduction of a legislation that would regulate this particular uh, supply model. Uh, on that note, I should say that the cannabis social clubs remain unregulated in Europe. Uh, Uruguay is the only exception. Uh, worldwide, so Uruguay is the only country or the only jurisdiction that has introduced uh, legislation nationwide that allows and regulates the CSE model. And so in my presentation, which will be uh, relatively short, I will just try to highlight some, some findings from both contexts illustrating what has been happening uh, with regards to CSEs in both Europe and in Uruguay. So to start with uh, just a brief update on the situation uh, in Europe, I'll just highlight three tricky findings from research uh, done so far. The first one is that CSCs are actually present in multiple EU member states. Um, we know that the CSC uh, model appeared first in the 90s as a result of grassroots initiatives in Spain, but there's evidence of an increasing presence of the model in other EU member states. In this mapping exercise we did, we found cannabis social clubs in at least 13 uh, EU member states. And I say at least for, for two reasons. Uh, the first one is that this was an exploratory study. So uh, we only managed to reach 81 cannabis social clubs, which is not a representative sample. If anything, we just managed to scratch the surface. Uh, in Spain alone, there's hundreds of active cannabis social clubs. Um, so this is likely to be an underestimate. And also we were not able to conclude with certainty whether or not there were cannabis social clubs in a few other countries. Those are the ones marked in blue in this map. So there we didn't really have strong evidence or we had conflicting information about whether or not there were cannabis social clubs active. Uh, and so I think the main message here is that while we might have anticipated that CSCs were perhaps a rare phenomenon in Europe, that does not seem to be the case. And the number of CSCs based on this study as well seems to have been increasing in the last decade. We saw uh, um, a, ro a growing number of cannabis social clubs being established uh, in the last decade in Europe. The second message that I wanted to bring to your attention today is that the cannabis social clubs in Europe and, and elsewhere as well have different features. And so they, and they engage in different activities and to a different extent. So they look different as well. A first example I wanted to, to just mention is that even in size, we found very small cannabis social clubs with just a few members who are friends uh, or a small network of people. But we also found, this is from the, the study I mentioned at the beginning, large cannabis social clubs. The largest one we identify had 5,000 members. Um, and so these, these are clubs where, where people might not necessarily know one another. If we look at the supply function, three in four clubs in our sample were actually producing and distributing cannabis uh, to their members. So they were active suppliers. And this was the case in at least seven EU member states. And if we look at the beyond supply, uh, we saw that the cannabis social clubs in Europe were also engaging in a range of other activities, ranging from training to their staff, um, education events, informative events, such as lectures on the medical use or the medical benefits of cannabis, workshops on how to set up cannabis social clubs, but also in living up to that uh, feature I mentioned at the beginning, they were also engaging in protests um, and collaborating with other organizations to try and advocate for a change in the status quo. However, um, not all clubs were engaging in all these activities. There were cases of clubs that were only actually distributing cannabis and not engaging in any other social or informative activities as well. A final point I wanted to make uh, with regards to CSEs in Europe is that, and it's perhaps a, a more obvious one, they remain unregulated uh, and therefore they're vulnerable to law enforcement detection and to legal sanctions. Uh, and within the EU so far, no uh, country has regulated this model. There have been several attempts to do so, but so far none have been successful. 
And so what we've seen is that the model remains and the movement remains rather vulnerable to, to police interventions and, and to law enforcement uh, detection. Uh, just recently, a prominent figure of the CSC scene and the, the broader cannabis movement in Spain has been uh, convicted to uh, jail for five years for his involvement with the Cannabis Social Club in Barcelona. In Belgium, several clubs have been uh, have faced court proceedings in the, in the last couple of years, and the, the most historic one, the oldest cannabis social club, has recently also uh, been brought to court. Uh, and, and so one could say that, that the CSC scene in Belgium is uh, sort of in the brink of extinction, or at least facing a very challenging uh, time. Uh, so to say that the development of, or the further development of the movement in, in, in Europe is, is, is challenged by this constraint as well. A very different picture or a very different story comes from Uruguay. And I'll just briefly mention also just two or three uh, highlights or two or three points. The first one is that very differently than in Europe, uh, cannabis social clubs are a novelty in Uruguay and they came with a new law. So there were no cannabis social clubs known to the country before this uh, cannabis law reform. And actually the CSC model was not included in the first version of this bill. So they, the, the initial idea was not to include cannabis social clubs as one of the legal models. Um, however, due to the, the, as the, as the conversation and the discussion moved on and also with the uh, advocacy from um, cannabis activists and users uh, that was changed. And also experts and people associated with the movement in Spain were brought into Uruguay actually to brief on what the experience in Spain had been so far. And CSTs were then included as one of the three legal supply models uh, foreseen in this new bill in, in Uruguay, alongside home cultivation and pharmacy sales. Uh, and, and I should say pharmacy sales in Uruguay are not necessarily meant for medical purposes, but uh, any user for recreational purposes can obtain cannabis at, at pharmacies there. At the moment, there are about 165 legal cannabis social clubs operating in Uruguay uh, with over 5,000 members. And with this regard, I should say that in Uruguay, there are very specific rules and requirements from the legislator as to how a cannabis social club should function within this framework. And I'll just point out some key elements uh, on that. So access to cannabis social clubs in Uruguay is restricted to Uruguayan citizens or residents who are 18 years old at least. And this is common to all three channels. Um, users need to register with one cannabis social club and one only. Uh, and the legislature already introduced a limitation as to the size of cannabis social clubs. So in Uruguay, the clubs will be relatively small with 15 to 45 members only. In terms of cultivation, the clubs are allowed to have uh, a maximum of 99 plants at one given point in time. And they have to draft these so-called cultivation plans. Basically, these are documents detailing the number of plants, the products that are being used, uh, who has access to the cultivation site, and so on. So this kind of information needs to be documented um, by the clubs themselves. And when it comes to distribution, the clubs are allowed to distribute 40 grams of cannabis uh, per month to each member. And they have some flexibility in terms of uh, when this might happen and the quantities up to this maximum threshold that might be delivered at each time. There are a number of other requirements. Um, I just listed here some of the more significant ones. For example, the clubs are not allowed to advertise their activities nor have any external sites that might identify them as such. They need to have certain security systems in place. And more recently, there's also been introduced a requirement for the clubs to have a social space for their members. And there's a number of location re restrictions, for example, uh, establishing a minimum distance between a cannabis social club and a, home a registered home grower or a pharmacy that is supplying cannabis, for example. And the IRCA is the newly created institute that monitors the implementation of this uh, new legal framework. So just to, for you to give you an idea, this is how CSCs in Uruguay uh, would look like and the requirements from a legal point of view. Uh, when it comes to findings from implementation, uh, something I wanted to highlight is that the CSCs in Uruguay have been a, a, an alternative to pharmacy sales. And here I wanted to make maybe two sub points. Uh, the first one is that they've played an important transition role. I should say that not all three models, so home cultivation, pharmacies and, and CSCs, were introduced at the same time. So first, uh, 
home cultivation was allowed in 2014. Uh, and then later on that year, CSCs uh, could start registering. But the pharmacy sales only actually started um, late in 2017. So in between that time, the CSCs were actually the only legal option for those users who wanted to obtain cannabis through a legal channel, but who did not want to cultivate cannabis themselves. And furthermore, there's still at the moment, and I apologize for the intervention from my dog. <laughs> um, just gonna pause here a second. Okay, <laughs> uh, apologies if it happens again. <laughs> there's an immediate uh, danger uh, passing by here. <laughs> uh, but as I was saying, there's only 14 pharmacies that have registered uh, with the national system and that have actually volunteered to supply cannabis within the pharmacies. So this, this remains a limited option um, at the moment and there's issues with supply at pharmacies. So the cannabis social clubs continue to be uh, an alternative for pharmacies. Another important point I want to make uh, in, in comparison to the pharmacies relates to the product itself. So one of the things that the users we talked to mentioned um, had to do with the product, they were, the product they were able to obtain at, at uh, the CSCs. At pharmacies in Uruguay, users can only buy um, one of two products and these are low THC uh, products. So they only have up to 10% THC. And so at cannabis social clubs, there are no restrictions to the potency of, uh, of the cannabis that is being distributed. And so this is by users as an advantage, um, the fact that they have more proximity with cultivation and that they have, for example, more say in terms of the strains that are being produced, the types of product that they can obtain through the cannabis social club vis-a-vis uh, -vis the pharmacy. So they have more selection and they have access to different kinds of products with higher potency as well, which would not be the case if they would only have to rely on the pharmacy supply. And then finally, uh, a last point I want to make with regards to Uruguay is that we've already uh, noticed also some issues regarding implementation. Uh, and these have primarily to do with the, the requirement of um, a registration, both for the CSC. So we've identified cases of cannabis social clubs uh, that have not completed this registration. And so they are in fact operating outside of this legal framework that I've just uh, mentioned. Uh, and also there are members of the cannabis social clubs that uh, they have registered and they are so, they are formal members of these associations, but who are, seem to be sharing the cannabis that they receive through this legal channel with users who are not registered. And so these and other elements seem to be pointing to the, to the, to the direction that there's some kind of gray market um, appearing in between what are the fully legal markets and the traditional illegal market that was already there prior to um, this legislation was introduced. And finally, another difference that we identified in Uruguay has to do with the social aspect of cannabis social clubs. So as I mentioned with regards to the European um, context, uh, cannabis social clubs there have tried to some extent to engage in social activities and harm reduction oriented initiatives. Um, much less of that in Uruguay. Um, and so the clubs there seem to be functioning almost as sort of a delivery point where, where users come to collect the cannabis and there's not necessarily that level of engagement between members and between members and the club itself. So to take a step back and at, and at the same time a step, a step forward and linking it to the topic of, of this uh, panel as well, I just wanted to make a, a couple of uh, concluding thoughts. And the first one would have to do with perhaps avoiding uh, framing the, the, the cannabis policy debate as this binary choice between prohibition and legalization. I think we all know um, that the choice is not just between these two ideas, but that in fact, um, it will have to do with the design of the specific supply models that will be um, thought of, and there are many other options uh, for that. And the Cannabis Social Club could be one of these options, uh, of one of these alternative models uh, for regulation going forward. And it has been uh, already introduced as, as in, in a few proposals so far, not successfully, but it is a model that could be considered alongside others when jurisdictions are perhaps uh, considering taking this step towards legalization. And furthermore, and, and I will end at that, 
Um, I think it's also important to bear in mind that the further or the more we do research on this area, what we find is that underneath this uh, concept of cannabis social club or this idea of a cannabis social club model, what we see is that there are many different realities and very different practices among cannabis social clubs, both within countries and across countries. Uh, we find cases of cannabis social clubs that seem to have abandoned, for instance, this idea of working on a nonprofit way and that perhaps resemble more these commercial clubs with a high number of members, with practices that would be more aligned with commercial suppliers. Uh, but we also saw clubs that are actually only open to medical users and have adapted their offer of products to that kind of um, segment of, of the market, so to say. And as I just was pointing out, uh, there's cannabis social clubs that have uh, a strong engagement with, with, uh, with establishing peer-to-peer -peer, uh, dynamics and to offer support to the users and to their members. But there are also cannabis social clubs that do not do this. And so this might have implications for harm reduction. Um, and I think it will be important to bear this uh, in mind when thinking of uh, designing uh, cannabis social club policies, for example. Thank you. I'll end at that. Well, wow. that was very, very interesting, Dr. Pardal. Thank you very much for your intervention. I know personally, I certainly wasn't aware of the existence of so many social clubs around Europe, as well as the criteria involved. Um, so, you know, very relevant to the discussions being held in various countries right now. Um, moving on to our next speakers, we're going to be focusing a little bit on growing cannabis as well as self-supply. Now, as most of our viewers know, um, the Maltese government right now actually recently just released a, a white paper proposals that um, included growing four plants at home. This led to a lot of discussion around the, the country, leading to one main question, you know, um, what does growing and self-cultivation involve exactly? And more importantly, are they seen and why are they seen as a human right? So next up, we've got Dr. Maya Kohek and Gabriele Kozar from ENCOD, who will talk about the self-cultivation or home grow of cannabis as a human right, as well as its advantages from a public health perspective and its pr practical implications. Thank you, Jonathan, for this introduction. So uh, first of all, I would like to say that I'm very happy that we started this conversation on the use of recreational cannabis at this level. Uh, me and Gabi, as you mentioned, come from ENCOT, which is a network of NGOs and individuals, companies, experts that all have the same vision, which is a just and effective drug policy. Um, so today we heard already a lot about the reasons and the possibilities of cannabis regulation, but one more thing has to be said, which is the right uh, of an adult individual to cultivate cannabis for own consumption. In ENCOT, we refer to it as freedom to farm, which was initiated by the founder of our organization, uh, Job Omen, who passed away five years ago. And uh, we believe it should be considered a fundamental human right. We also see the Freedom to Farm initiative as a path to sustainable development of the world's economies and farming policies that will protect little farmers as well as um, provide uh, self-sufficient production and consumption models. The right to grow cannabis for personal use is related to the right to traditional medicines. It is well known that cannabis was one of the commonly used plants in various healing systems from India, China to Europe. Besides traditional medicine, cannabis has been extensively used and is still used as a religious sacrament in various places across the world. Communities in Southeast Asia, the Caribbean, South and Central America are not the only ones who still use it for religious purposes. For example, in my doctoral thesis, I was researching contemporary ritual or spiritual use of cannabis in Catalonia, in Spain. Um, in the community I was doing field work in, the, ca the cannabis is cultivated in, pe in people's gardens. So women are processing the plant, making cosmetics, baking cookies, but most of it is dried and smoked pure during prayer and meditation. They these people learned how to use it in order to obtain the most possible benefits from it and how to mitigate possible unwanted effects. And this knowledge is then transmitted from experienced elders of the community to the younger generations. Their use is non-problematic. They live normal lives, they have jobs, uh, a good quality of community life and well-being. 
So the right to practice religion and belief is a basic human right and communities such as the one that I was researching should have the freedom to practice their belief without the risk of legal prosecution and um, economic or social consequences related to it. Not so long ago in Slovenia, the country where I come from, each family farm grew cannabis plant plants for a variety of purposes. The generation of my grandparents, for example, still remember it being not only an important crop for textile, ropes or livestock feeding, but they also used it for therapeutic purposes and for pleasure. So it should be said that um, no one becomes a user without enjoying the sensations and experiencing pleasure when using cannabis and not everyone does. So this is clear from prevalent studies that uh, show a far greater percentage of people trying cannabis at least once in their lives, but then a far lower percentage of those who continue to engage in regular use afterwards. It is not everyone's cup of tea and those who enjoy it um, should not be seen as dependent or as problematic or as criminals. In, um, it is time that governments recognize the rights of adults to decide how we want to live our lives and implement a framework that respects the, our personal liberties. Prohibiting recreational use of cannabis is not going to make it disappear. What makes sense from the harm reduction perspective and public health perspective, as Mireya perfectly explained, is to educate people about the safest ways of how to obtain it and how to use it. And that's only possible within a regulated framework. So allowing cultivation of cannabis for personal use does not mean everyone who is using cannabis will also grow it. Not everyone has a green thumb, the time, the space or the motivation to do it. But those who do need a legal framework which will ensure that they are not going to end up in jail, having their children taken away and being stigmatized as drug traffickers for the rest of their lives just because they were growing four cannabis plants in their garden. As we heard earlier and as you mentioned um, just now, the Maltese government included personal cultivation for private consumption in the recently published white paper. And in ENCOT, we commend this decision and think that it is a necessary model that should be part of uh, cannabis regulation in any country. At the end, uh, cannabis a, is an important element of our natural and cultural heritage, and it deserves to be treated as, as such. And now I give my word to Gabi. Okay, so <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, so the freedom to farm is essential to the future of our planet. And as Maya already mentioned, uh, only on a legal market, uh, it is possible to have uh, safe cannabis. Uh, we believe that it's necessary to accept a non-problematic, responsible adult use of cannabis, which should be allowed to adults everywhere. And as a logical consequence of it, responsible adults should be allowed to grow their own cannabis. Cannabis or hemp, it is the same plant, cannabis sativa came to Europe through Russia and Central Asia. Uh, the oldest mentionings of hemp in Europe were found around 800. Uh, the plant then later was widely used and supported for industry like paper press and nautical equipment, a secure in pharma industry. At this time, nobody knew about the content of cannabinoids or any poss possible negative effects of the cannabis plant. Uh, in the industrial area, the plant became unimportant for mass production. High taxes on hemp in the beginning of the 20th century in the USA made it very expensive as a resource for industry. Then in World War II, they were lacking the products because the new synthetics like nylon and stuff could not replace what they needed. So actually the US government asked farmers again to grow cannabis. Followed by the portrayal of cannabis in the media, 
as a disinhibiting and violence inducing drug that makes uh, white women have sex with black guys. Uh, ultimately, ultimately brought hemp cultivation to a complete standstill. So it looks like cannabis was always threatened by various lobbies. Uh, in my home country, Austria, and not only there, uh, the same goes for neighboring countries like uh, Italy, Slovenia, etc. It was deep seated, seated at least since the Middle Ages. Names of Austrian towns like Amstetten, that's Hempstetten, or Hanftal, Hemp Village, are proof of that. Nowadays, for some reason, whenever it comes to the discussion to allow home growing, the most common argument that arises is that it is dangerous to consume homegrown cannabis because of the heavy metals, pesticides, fungicides, mold, and many more bad and toxic stuff that is said to be found in the cannabis. First of all, most of the homegrown cannabis is grown indoors on special certified soil. Uh, the few outdoor exceptions even grow at the same spot in the same soil, breathe the same air and get the same water as the other vegetables for home consumption in the garden. So what are the advantages of home growing for home consumption? People can grow their carefully chosen cannabis strains with a level of cannabinoids according to their own needs. Gardening helps relieve stress. No adulterants like uh, Mireya mentioned, like synthetic cannabinoids are sprayed on it, no silica, no other substances to make them way more smell better, things that make people sick or even kill. And uh, you don't support uh, any war action, no weapon deals, no slavery and torture, no exploitation of men, women and children no feeding of the illicit market and its criminal affairs and dirty deeds. And in case of free or at least affordable access to education about organic farming of the cannabis to testing facilities and responsible use, it is the safest product on the market. People have always and will always consume drugs. Let's guide them to a healthy way of doing that. Let us regulate cannabis and home grow. Never forget the freedom to farm our basic human right. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Maya and Gabriella, for you know explaining a bit of the history as well as the as well as the uses um, and applications of this plant. I think especially Maltese viewers who are thinking about growing and considering sending their contributions to the government have a lot to think about after your intervention. So thank you very much for that. Um, now to conclude this panel, we're going to be turning to our final panelist, toxicologist, Dr. Fabian Peter Steinmetz. Now, Dr. Steinmetz obtained a PhD in predictive toxicology from Liverpool, John Moores University in the UK, as well as a postdoc with the Merck Group in the area of drug design. He works at the international consultancy Delphic HSE Limited since early 2016 and has authored and co-authored over 200 safety assessments, expert opinions and scientific publications. Um, he is a European registered toxicologist since the early 2020 and he's supported, uh, he supports an evidence-based drug policy reform as a committee member of an independent German expert panel, Schildauer Kreis, apologies if I mispronounced that. And today he will be talking to us about cannabis and driving, um, strategies for the harmonization of legal driving limits in the European Union. Now, of course, with the EU's freedom of movement, we have the right to drive across the European U Union. However, with the fragmented legal situations across the EU, how can we ensure that cannabis consumers don't end up in a sticky situation just because they might have smoked a joint the night before driving? Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, so I guess you can hear and see me. Oh, yeah, we can see my presentation. Yep. So yeah, I will talk a little bit about cannabis and driving and you know potential strategies for harmonization of driving limits within the European Union. And um, so first, a few basics. Um, um, there are a lot of things which can uh, actually provoke driving impairment. And for many of those, we have tolerance. But first, 
um, let's get a little bit aware of typical statistical measures. There's a thing called um, odds ratio, which is um, very commonly used as a, as a statistical measure. And basically, um, you can imagine that one is like a, a default. And if you have a higher number, um, for example, odds ratio of four, um, you have a higher incidences um, of, for example, uh, likelihood for accidents or um, in increased errors in a driving simulator. Um, but keep in mind that an odds ratio, for example, of four does not mean necessarily that it's four times more. It's very often it's less. Um, if you see relative risk, this is the actual um, infold increase. So just when we look at the graph later, uh, just for you to understand. Um, with regard to tolerance, um, I just would like to remind that we have tolerance, for example, um, um, for tiredness, disease, age, medications, and also we have for alcohol um, certain limits. But actually for the majority of substances which could either impair or increase risk-taking behavior, like for example stimulants, um, from, it actually doesn't matter if it's coffee or coca cocaine or amphetamine, um, we actually for, for most substances, unless they are Ill illegal or narcotics uh, or alcohol, we actually don't have tests. So that's uh, some interesting trivia. So it's difficult um, to come up with, with good thresholds. And that's probably also the reason why you invited me. I mean, <laughs> um, it's um, to, to quote, um, amount of THC in blood is not as strongly related to driver impairment as blood alcohol concentration is to alcohol impaired driving. This was a finding of a, a big European Canadian meta-analysis and it was also very recently confirmed by an Australian study. But first get a little impression um, of the risk and the prevalence uh, associated with different drugs. So we, we see here the risk, so this is an odds ratio um, and we see the prevalence. So how often uh, those, uh, those accidents basically uh, uh, occur. Um, we actually see um, that drugs which are quite prevalent, like uh, you know, uh, alcohol and THC and also benzodiazepine are, are quite on the top with regard to prevalence. And with risk, we see that um, particularly moderate to high levels alcohol are quite critical and alcohol drug combinations and drug drug combinations. Um, with amphetamine, it's a kind of mixed. We actually see amphetamines that twice because it really depends on what type of amphetamine and the dose is very important. Uh, funnily, low amphetamine levels and of course certain amphetamines it actually <laughs> uh, decrease your risk. Yeah? So for alcohol, um, sorry, for, for cannabis, for THC, it's um, there's also some dose, um, dose dependence, but it's not as clear as with, with alcohol. So it's only expressed in one point. But we have to imagine that um, cannabis uh, at, at low THC concentrations is probably a, a lower than um, odds ratio of two and, uh, and very high doses or for example, edible, edibles might lead to even um, values above two. But we see they are quite, um, quite similar to um, yeah, to, to moderate levels of alcohol. So it should be possible to regulate. So what's currently happening in Europe? Um, so here's some ex um, a, a table with some examples for countries and the different thresholds. Um, many of those countries only have um, in one threshold, but there are, for example, countries like Norway, they have a three thresholds, so a kind of staggered limit. Uh, we later uh, see in, um, in the, my suggestion or my proposal what this could mean or what, what this means. Or we have, for example, Netherlands um, with um, two different levels. One, if it's single use, so mono consumption, or if there's also uh, a second drug in the system. Um, as we just learned, um, this can be an issue if you combine multiple drugs or drug and alcohol. So this is why Netherlands distinguish two different um, limits. And also what I need to mention is that um, there is a difference between um, those levels, nanograms per milliliters, between whole blood and between serum. Uh, so this is almost a factor two. So when we look at the current German um, threshold, which is one nanogram per one milliliter THC in serum, so this was cor would correspond to 0 0.5 nanograms per milliliter in whole blood. 
So um, I was recently recently working on a, um, on an expert opinion from the Schildor Kreis, and uh, they actually suggested um, three and ten nanograms per milliliter in serum as a staggered limit. Um, so basically, if you're below three, you're you're considered sober. If you're between three and ten, you're only considered um, impaired if you also have some clinical symptoms. And if you are above 10, you're always considered impaired. So um, interestingly, um, the Canadian model, and I mean, they have now some experience with legalization. Uh, the Canadian model is quite similar. So if you translate serum to whole blood, the, the German and the Canadian, or the, the German proposed one, which was actually uh, declined a few weeks ago, um, it's quite similar to the Canadian one. Um, something very important to mention, which um, is very important for roadside testing, but also for cannabis in um, the working environment. Um, there's a practice of THC COOH immunoassays. So this, these are particularly urine tests uh, where you can uh, detect cannabis uh, metabolites for days and weeks after consumption. So this is a common practice in some work environments and in some countries with regard to road tests. And yeah, Sorry for being so strict, but I mean, this has to stop. These tests do not have anything to do with um, an acute impairment. So I just want to emphasize this. Um, and this is probably also the reason why I find memes like this on the, on the web. Um, this is how people feel uh, about uh, regulations and legislations um, with regard to cannabis and driving. There's some really ridiculous limits and considerations there which do not allow, allow even people driving when they are sober. So a little bit of chemistry, just that you, because you, you might be already confused by expressions like THC, COOH. So um, in the plant, um, you usually have in the trichomes um, THCA, which is also an acid form of THC. Um, this usually gets decarboxylated. Um, by, for example, uh, baking or vaping or smoking. And then you have the active compound THC. Um, THC um, becomes then in your body metabolized to hydroxy THC. This um, hydroxy THC is particularly interesting if um, you use edibles, so uh, cannabis infused food, um, because then you can have a uh, a so-called first pass effect where you actually produce quite um, a substantial quantity of THCOH and um, this substance actually has um, a comparable um, activity, some even say uh, higher ones, probably depends on the assay you use. Um, so this THCOH is also um, a psychoactive component, um, particularly interesting for edibles. So and this THCOH then gets further metabolized into an inactive metabolite, which is the THCOH. And this is the one you, um, which is lingering around for quite a while, particularly in your urine, and where this testing does not make any sense because this compo compound is not psychoactive at all. So just as a friendly reminder, THC is not as simple as alcohol. Um, and I just wanna explain a little bit why this is. So first of all, we're talking about lower quantities, um, which are used and therefore are in your body. So for alcohol, um, we, we are just talking about completely different uh, quantities. So we consume gr rather grams than milligrams. Um, so there are also differences in toxicokinetics. Um, so you, you might have heard of, of first order and zero order. So there's uh, for alcohol, there's a kind of a uh, linear decay and for cannabis like actually for most um, pharmaceutical substances uh, it's a bit more complex so actually in the beginning uh, you actually you have a, a big a, a lot of metabolization going on and at the end it's slowing down and therefore it's very crucial to have um, good limits that those substances lingering around for quite a while in your body um, that they are basically are not taken as a uh, critical for impairment. Also, we have um, an issue with uh, lipophilicity. Um, cannabinoids in general are very lipophilic. And this is also why we have uh, such a, a strong difference between uh, serum, plasma, full blood, whole blood, um, and 
therefore standardization there is also quite needed um, it, when we want to compare different limits within Europe. Also, we have to mention impairment is more subtle with THC or with cannabis compared to alcohol. So people usually don't think that they are awesome drivers then, they actually rather drive careful. So even if people are similarly impaired, um, like for example, in this comparison here, uh, you know, uh, you know, nearly four nanograms per milliliter are comparable to 0 0.5 uh, grams per liter alcohol. Even in such a case, usually a cannabis user would drive slower and more careful. But yeah, so just here as, a, uh, as an example, we have a figure where we can compare a typical alcohol limit to a THC limit. Um, this is based on a very robust mathematical uh, meta-analysis. Although there are more recent studies actually suggesting um, slightly higher figures. So I really want to quickly suggest two, uh, three different um, scenarios. The first one might sound a bit radical, um, but if you think a bit about it, so maybe you have to sleep over it a little bit, it actually makes quite some sense. So the first suggestion is no standard testing at all. So basically clinically determined impairment alone shall lead to penalties. Forensic data would only support narratives. This is common practice actually for most uh, psychoactive substances. If we really consider all psychoactive substances, we, uh, are, we engage in our yeah, in our lives. So caffeine, nicotine, valerian root, kava, kava, antihistamines, and so on and so forth. And also for other factors, I mean, we can't measure a degree of sickness. We can't measure a degree of tiredness. And of course, it would be ageism to, um, you know, define a certain age when no one is allowed to drive anymore, or, uh, you're, you know, you're 50 plus, you're not allowed to drive over 30 kilometers per hour anymore, you know. Um, so it's actually plausible to go uh, do such approach, but probably the next one is a bit more pragmatic for most people. So this is the, actually the suggestion from the Bundestag hearing. Um, so basically having a limit of three nanograms and 10 nanograms. And in between, you would need, uh, uh, you know, a, a physician would need uh, to investigate if you have clinical symptoms or not. Then there's a third thing I would li quickly like to mention, which is the so-called cannabis influence factor. So imagine that I said that um, not only THC is psychoactive, but also the metabolite, particularly in when you use edibles, uh, of THC or H. So if you have high level of TH, TH or H, this of course also is contributing and this cannabis influencing factor is basically considering this one as well. But on the other hand, um, you actually see that uh, uh, the higher your THC COH level is, uh, the lower um, your, your cannabis influence factor will be because THC COH is basically also an indicator of what regular user you are um, or how regular you use. And therefore it's an, a slight indicator for tolerance and therefore um, basically, uh, yeah, a compensation going on in, in your in the human body uh, as we have a lot of pharmaceutical drugs as well you know when you start uh, using benzodiazepines you're not allowed to drive but if you have um, a certain steady state and you are um, below certain levels um, you are you are allowed to drive and um, so this this type of concept is all in this equation i'm afraid the current approach by just using it like that with molar concentration is not that promising uh, with regard to correlating to um, odds ratios, so for you know with uh, accidents and errors and simula simulations, um, but it's still I think a very interesting aspect to do further research on. So maybe some aspects uh, are still needed, maybe some some uh, further factors are needed, but um, I think this is very promising to investigate more in this area and then maybe come up with other limits. But yeah, so far I'm probably would suggest um, the second one. So at least this is my conclusion here. Harmonization is difficult. Um, however, we just, due to justice and fairness, we, we need to put appropriate tolerance into place. Suggestions one and three are either unlikely to gain support from member states, you know, testing not at all, sounds a bit radical for some people, 
although we do this with a lot of drugs. Um, and on the other hand, um, the, my, my third suggestion, I mean, it's still a little bit faulty and Im impractical and still need some work on it. So I would like to stick then with the proposal of three and 10 nanograms per milliliter THC in serum. And because the majority of countries use whole blood, though I would prefer serum, but due to the majority and I want harmonization and you know, in Europe, we, we want some harmonization, particularly with regard to those critical items. So I would then suggest a column in the middle, which is then translated to whole blood, which would be then 1.5 and five nanograms per milliliter as a staggered limits for um, yeah, uh, driving uh, under the influence or not under the influence of cannabis. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Dr. Steinmetz. Um, some very eye-opening information there. You know, I'm sure policymakers around Europe will be looking specifically for this type of information as the discussion matures. Um, everyone that's watching, that wraps up the conference for today. As we've heard from the host of this conference, MEP Cyrus Enger, say earlier on today, following this conference, the speakers and EDCOD will be putting together a set of policy recommendations calling for all European decision makers and member state influencers to adopt a human rights based approach to recreational cannabis policies. Um, they'll be available on NCOD's website www.ncod.org. Additionally, as many of you know, the government of Malta's public consultation on their white paper regarding recreational cannabis is currently open until mid-May. So, you know, the government is encouraging everyone to send their contributions in and make their opinions heard. So if you have something to say about this, definitely get in contact with the government. Now is the time. Um, now that we have come to the end of this conference, I'm certain, I'm certain viewers, you know, will have been given a better understanding of cannabis policy and the current legal situations regarding cannabis across the European Union. Once again, thank you all for tuning in. Until next time, this has been Jonathan Chilia, Deputy Editor with Love of Malta, and this has been Rolling into the Future, Recreational Cannabis Legislation in the EU, Exploring Human Rights-Based Policies for Future Legislation, a conference by MEP Cyrus Center. Thank you once again. Well, I guess just as Jonathan said, wow. I knew that these experts were going to give us all really important insight into the topic, but I didn't realize just how much. I think a lot of points raised in these panel discussions are extremely interesting and important. But more importantly, as a European policymaker, they helped me understand cannabis policy holistically. Locally, this gave me an indication of what can be added to the current Maltese government's white paper to really make it a policy based on social justice. On a European level, this conference will be followed up by ANCOD itself, who will be putting together a set of recommendations which are calling for European decision makers to influence member states to adopt human rights-based approaches to recreational cannabis policies. As a local politician and a citizen of Malta who, just like you, has the opportunity to contribute to the Maltese government's current debate on recreational cannabis, I have decided to contribute to the public consultation by working on ENCOD's recommendations and taking them even further and adapt them to the local context. In my recommendations to the government, I will first and foremost be proposing that both at a local and European level, we remove this topic from the discussion sphere relating to home affairs, police and justice, and start talking about this topic within the context of health and social policy. In terms of more concrete action, I will be proposing a cultivation social enterprise model like the one in Uruguay. Such a model would create the establishment of social enterprises which would be legally allowed to grow cannabis on behalf of established and registered members. Such a club which would be mandated to adhere to strict security measures of the highest regard would also adopt community enhancement measures such as educational and real information campaigns that basically do not use the terms war on drugs or fallacies to create fear-mongering, but instead use harm reduction measures induced with empathy and understanding to showcase clear, scientific, accurate and empathic information. Additionally, in my recommendations to government, we will be proposing that such facilities are able to also link members to community-based services such as addiction services or psychosocial services, should they need them. 
Such a system, in my view, should also require total financial transparency and accountability to the public. As we heard in the beginning of this conference by Professor Marco Rossi and Professor Justus Haukap, billions of money is given to the Mafia every year because of the deregulation surrounding cannabis policy. This will be a clear way for Malta to rid itself from the shackles many countries find themselves in. Restrained to when it comes to organized crime in the Mediterranean because of their own non-regulation of the cannabis market. In the recommendations, I will be proposing to the Maltese government that such social enterprises would be only available to members of the club who register there with their identity document and who must be residents of Malta. Members would not only be registered with the club, but they must also go through an intake interview where the social enterprise would need to find out more information about the member him or herself, such as their frequency of use, their personal history with cannabis use, and other kinds of information, such as in what settings they consume, their lifestyle, and the measures they can take to ensure their consumption is responsible and safe on an individual level. In the system I am proposing, such social enterprises would be able to grow plants for citizens who do not have the means to grow cannabis in their own residence, due to, for example, the cost of hydroponics, or issues relating to space or access to sunlight, and would be mandated to do so in a sustainable way which does not include harmful pesticides, GMOs, or synthetic properties. Additionally, I would like to see such enterprises provide specific information on the THC to CBD content and the specific effects that specific strains can give to individuals depending on the type and breeding of the strain in order to ensure that consumers are choosing the right product for them and their needs and to ensure that everyone in the country has fair and equal access to this civil freedom. Such a policy would ensure that a number of requirements needed to mitigate public concern can finally be fulfilled, such as public health, public safety, transparency and accountability. It allows a legal security for consumers, ensures affordable access, ensures young people are effectively kept away from cultivation, controls production in terms of better quality, THC, CDB and CBN, by ensuring control and balance, creates a strong sense of sensibilization, empowers consumers and the general public with accurate scientific information and ensures a transparent relationship between growers and consumers. Friends, the future is here and we cannot be afraid of it. For all too long we have been having the wrong conversations about a topic which we have known very little about. It's time to stop that. It's time to listen to academics, to scientists, the social workers and the activists on the ground with regards to how we can start to face the reality. Many people across Malta, the EU and the world use cannabis and how their right must be protected as consumers, as citizens and as human beings. I'm Cyrus Sanger, Member of the European Parliament, and this has been Rolling into the Future, recreational cannabis legislation in the European Union, exploring human rights-based policies for future legislation. Thank you for following.